for today, uh, Mel Fitting from uh, City University of New York uh, is the chairman of this session, and we will have the presentation of Crypto Center and then the talk by E.L. Weiss. Please. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm, I will begin, I'll uh, introduce Romina Padro. Uh, our speaker today, E.L. Weiss, is uh, at the uh, Song Kripke Center at the CUNY Graduate Center. And Romina is the uh, director of it. Uh, actually, Yale is the what, assistant director. So uh, Romina, why don't you talk perhaps about directing? <laughs> OK, thank you, Mel. Uh, all right, so uh, at the center, well, uh, probably most of you know that Seoul has a lot of, a lot of work that is unpublished, is uh, really a substantial amount of work that is unpublished. I think that if, when I die, there will still be some recordings to transcribe and uh, I'm not hoping to finish everything. So part of what we do is uh, we convert all that material that is in tapes sometimes, sometimes in manuscripts, sometimes in manuscripts that have been typed in the old machines. So they need to be digitalized. And the audio, of course, also needs to be converted into digital audio. So what we do is, uh, especially, you know, old tapes, we are always concerned that with time, uh, the material degrades. So we convert that into audio and we don't do that. Usually we use professionals to do that. Then that material is transcribed. That usually takes a lot of time and there are things that is you know more difficult than others to do because when it's technical work and you just have the audio and don't have notes or anything else and you know you then you have him pointing at the blackboard and of course that's not in the recording so that that's problematic but um, so you know we go over the transcriptions and in the last phase of all this, I go over the transcripts with Saul and well, they really changed a lot. And <laughs> you probably know that he has a lot of footnotes for, for example. So that, that's one of the main things that we do. Yale uh, works with me doing all this. And uh, sometimes we hire and graduate students or, you know, someone, other people willing or interested in the material for transcription. And, uh, and the final stage is publication. So uh, right now we are, uh, we, have, uh, we have been, we have been we're working in a book on recursion theory. And the book has uh, been just a month ago uh, approved for publication by OUP. So, and, and the book is done. We need to just adjust a couple of things. And so I'm hoping that by the end of the year, we can, we can send the, the final version. And then we have been working on uh, logical travels. There is a collection of papers and many of those papers are unpublished. And we have been trying to publish in journal some of the papers that will be included there. So, you know, to get a wider public. And uh, today, uh, um, this is news to Yale. We uh, got one of the papers uh, approved for publication is the mathematical incompleteness one that is gonna be published. And we have a couple of other papers that are also in review and in the last stages. So I'm hoping that uh, everything will be fine with those as well. I think so. Um, but uh, so those are the main things that we try to do uh, at the center. The, the work sometimes is, is slow because there are a lot of stages, but um, I, I enjoy working with Saul. It's, it's kind of wild working with Saul because he takes you all over the place. I have worked with him on, I don't know, on a paper on the first person, on recursion theory, on linguistics, on, you know, it's 
the diversity is such that uh, it's hard to get bored. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, and he enjoys working. He protests sometimes about having to revise. Uh, but uh, I think uh, sometimes it got, I, I like it when it comes from him that he says, you know, let's see it and finish this paper. And uh, sometimes that when that happens, that's good. This semester, we are going to do a, a course on modern logic because uh, Yale, uh, Yale is the main person here. I am there too, but he has done almost all the work. He's been editing a volume uh, on uh, Saul's work on modern logic. And there are a number of people, including Mel, for instance, that uh, have papers in that volume. And the idea of the course is that every, every week, one of the uh, persons that have papers in, in the volume will present the paper and we will discuss it. And so we'll, we'll have his own paper too, uh, and Yale as well. Uh, so that's the program for uh, this semester. And uh, we have been doing uh, courses uh, in the last two semester with a similar format. Um, one was on the adoption problem and, and the last one was uh, on papers on the Wittgenstein book. And we, we are very liberal about uh, letting people come and hear the classes. So if anyone is interested in joining us, the, the, the seminar is on uh, Wednesdays from two to four, New York time. And you, know, you just have to write an email to me or to Yale and we'll include you in the list. And uh, there have been very interesting exchanges that Zoom have made possible in people that woke up very early in New Zealand to join the seminar and people that were in California. <laughs> and that was also early for them, I guess. Um, so uh, we also have events at the, at the center and that you can participate in, in those as well, you know, if you want to join the list of uh, people that are contacted every time we have an event. So uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions about the center, uh, you're welcome to ask me. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you, Romina. So okay. just, uh, I just like to, to ask maybe one the short question. So, um, I mean, uh, is there a kind of in this? Uh, you, are you organizing a regular seminar where people are, to, are meeting to talk uh, to present some talks or something like that? Or the seminar is really a class. It's it's so source regular class uh, that this semester he's doing with Yale. The last semester he did it with me. Uh, but, you know, he has been teaching and that's a lot for the last, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, mm. Wednesdays from two to four. And uh, so, but because of Zoom, you know, when the pandemic started, we were doing this course on recursion theory, which was sort of a nightmare to do on Zoom. Uh, but then uh, when we got an opportunity to plan things uh, for the following fall, we thought about doing something that could include more people. And uh, so we did this seminar on, on the adoption problem. And you know there were a number of papers that people have already written about it and they were presented. And, and there were interesting discussions, I think. And, and well, at least people kept coming. That's, that's all I can say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's a class, but it's not really a class because there's nobody really teaching. It's more like a, then we have a special session with the students when we try to explain what's going on. And it's more, a, you know, an exchange and a presentation of a paper and discussion of the paper. And uh, Saul gives his point of view. And you know we open the discussion for everybody. That's uh, it's more like a kind of workshop thing. 
Okay, someone is asking on the chat if uh, it's something uh, because uh, I, I guess that, that, that uh, because of the pandemic is online. So is it possible to attend the seminar online, this class yes, online? Yes. Yeah, okay. yes, yes, yes. I mean, I can see people here that are, have been coming to the seminar. And yes, totally. I mean, it's just a matter of emailing Yale or me and uh, we will will include you in the list of participants and then you'll get an email every week with the zoom link uh, for now uh, definitely this semester and very likely the next semester we are going to keep doing it on zoom uh, you know so sister passed away because of COVID. So we have been very concerned and he has been here. We, I'm in a farm in New Jersey throughout the pandemic and he has been here with us. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, so Oksana, she's asking uh, the email. Well, uh, Oksana, you have to look at the, you go to the crypto center and then you will find the, you, you will find the email. I, I already I posted it in the chat as well. Okay, okay, very good. Thanks. Okay. Okay, any other questions for Romina? All right, then let's move on to our speaker today, Yale Weiss. Uh, Yale got his PhD from CUNY uh, under Graham Priest, uh, not many years ago, actually. Uh, and uh, He's already had papers in, uh, I see here, Journal of Philosophical Logic, Review of Symbolic Logic, and Studia Logica. So he's, uh, his work has been very interesting. And rather stupidly, I forgot to write down the actual title of your talk today. But uh, I will leave that to you. Uh, uh, if you have any, do you prefer questions held to the end? Uh, the talk is fairly short, so maybe it would make sense to leave to the end. Okay, so uh, if you have, uh, want to ask a question when we're to that point, if you would uh, uh, type uh, some notice into the chat window that you want to ask a question, then, then I can keep track of uh, uh, the order in which you come in. Okay, so Yale, you want to take it? All right, uh, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so the title of my talk is a reinterpretation of the semi-lattice semantics with applications, um, which is also the title of the paper that was published in the journal, Lodica Universalis. Uh, so I guess let's just uh, dive right into it. Um, so as in the case of modal logic, uh, contemporary relevance logic first sort of arose in a thoroughly syntactic fashion, you know, axiom systems, that sort of thing. Uh, and only later did logicians sort of start working to develop a semantics, or if you prefer a model theory, uh, for the previously proposed systems. Among the most important of these early systems was the anderson Belknap system R, relevant implication. Uh, for the details, just consult the standard references. Uh, various different or related semantics were subsequently developed for R uh, and other systems like E. Um, some of the history can be found in this nice uh, Inbo and Dunn article. Um, these include the sort of ternary relational semantics developed by Routley and Meyer, which I guess is the, the most well-known. Uh, the hybrid partial order operational semantics of Kit Fine in his 1974 paper, Models for Entailment. And then the sort of operational or semi-lattice semantics of Alistair Urquhart, um, which was developed in a series of papers and his dissertations spanning 1970 through 1973 or so. Um, I think most logicians would concede wherever their allegiances lie that of the three approaches, the semi-lattice semantics is the most mathematically elegant uh, and immediately intuitive. Um, I have a little note down here about um, some of the debate that has occurred over the Routley-Meyer semantics. 
Um, unfortunately, qua semantics for R, it has a big problem. Uh, even the positive fragment of R is incomplete with respect to it. Um, that is, there are things that are valid in the semi-lattice semantics that are not provable in R, uh, or even the positive fragment of R. Instead, the semantics, uh, the semi-lattice semantics determine the different logic, uh, which I'm going to call S. Uh, and there is an axiomatization for S, which you can find in this abstract of kits in this paper by Charlwood. Um, I'm not going to show you the axiomatization because it's, it's really um, convoluted. Um, but I, I don't know if that's philosophically important. Uh, polemical aside, um, it's not really so clear why this incompleteness result should matter in any deep way. A perfectly reasonable position one might have is if R, or positive R, whatever you want to say, uh, is not complete with respect to what is arguably the best semantics for relevance logics, so much the worse for it. This is essentially my own view. Um, one could take the attitude, or one could take an attitude towards R akin to the attitude taken by most modern modal logicians towards the CI Lewis systems S1 and S2. That is, I mean, these are systems that people don't really, are not so much interested in for their own sake. I mean, to the extent that people are interested in them still, they're just interested in them as like historical curiosities. Um, I don't know, maybe that's unfair. If somebody has some deeper interest in these systems, I'd be interested to hear about it. Um, but I think it's fair to say most people are interested in systems like S4 and S5, not systems like S1 and S2. Okay, my interest in this talk and also in the article um, is not to argue for that thesis, um, but it is to argue for a related thesis, namely that the semi-lattice semantics can be given an elegant and natural BHK-inspired interpretation, and that this intuitive and elegant BHK-inspired interpretation uh, redounds to the benefit of those logics which can be characterized exactly with it. Um, so not to the benefit of systems like positive R or R, but to the benefit of these new systems or old systems. Um, it turns out that the semantics can be used to characterize and motivate not only existing systems like intuitionistic logic, J, uh, but also a novel family of constructive quasi-relevance logics. Uh, for relevance logicians who have semantics first to constructivist inclinations, uh, the members of this family will, I hope, seem more interesting than the members of the traditional anderson Bonap family. So here's the plan of the talk. Uh, I'm just going to give an informal exposition of the semi-lattice semantics and present my own sort of BHK and hard reinterpretation of it. I'm then going to move on to a formal exposition of the semi-lattice semantics for J. Then I'm going to discuss some variations, uh, including Kit Fine's truth maker semantics for J, as well as how the semantics can be modified to yield systems like Yankov's logic, KC, uh, and this interesting family of quasi-relevant logics. So uh, that's where we're going. Um, before discussing my own interpretation of the semi-lattice semi semantics, I should say something briefly about, uh, well, what the frames are and what the standard interpretation of them is. So I'm going to be very informal about this because I'll be giving a more formal presentation later. But briefly, a semi-lattice frame is simply a joined semi-lattice, so at least upper bounds, um, with a least element, which I will usually write zero. Um, Everybody will recall that uh, a joint center lattice is also going to be a partial order. So in, the, in that sense, this is a, a, a persistification or a, a narrowing of uh, the Kripke semantics. Um, so Urquhart proposed an informational interpretation of these. Um, there is a set of pieces of information, an operation join for combining pieces of information, and a null or empty piece of information. Uh, this interpretation in turn provides sort of intuitive glosses for the truth conditions for the connectives. So for example, a piece of information is going to support or make true a disjunction if and only if it supports one of the disjuncts. It's going to make true a conditional if only if uh, for any piece of information that makes the antecedent true or supports the antecedent, uh, the combination of the sort of original piece of information and that piece of information supports the consequent. The informational interpretation is nice. I'm not going to be arguing against it, uh, but I believe that a more interesting and illuminating interpretation of the semi-lattice semantics is possible. 
Uh, to that end, I will discuss the BHK semantics for intuitionistic logic and examine how this might be related to the semi lattice semantics. And I should note that Urquhart himself, at least to a limited extent, anticipated this, although not with the semantics precisely in mind, uh, rather with the sort of logic. Um, yeah. Um, so you will recall that the, the basic idea of the BHK semantics, put roughly, is that the meaning of a complex formula is going to be articulated recursively by specifying its proof conditions. Um, so I think the following presentation is more or less standard. I mean, there is some variation in how these things get presented in the literature, um, but these, these seem to be more or less standard. So a proof of a conjunction is just a combination of a proof of the one conjunct with the proof of the other. A proof of a disjunction is given by giving either a proof of the left disjunct or the right disjunct. A proof of an arrow is a construction which, given a proof of the antecedent, returns a proof of the consequent. And there is no proof of bottom. OK, I'll just give you a moment to let that sink in, because it's going to sort of guide a lot of what comes after. OK, so one, two, three, four, conjunction, disjunction, arrow, bottom. The following two variations on the standard conditions will also be of interest in what follows. Uh, so we have this deviant condition for conjunction. Um, a proof of a conjunction is given by giving a proof of B, which is also a proof of C. So that's more extensional in character. And a proof of bottom is a proof of everything, uh, different from the condition that a proof of there is no proof of bottom. Um, so, I mean, one thing to note is that one prime over here has an intentional aspect. We're combining proofs. One, uh, one has an intentional aspect, one prime does not. Uh, similarly, uh, four, this condition, is stronger than four prime because if there is no proof of bottom, ipso facto, any proof of bottom is a proof of everything. Uh, the general shape of the proposed semantics is as follows. The BHK conditions clearly have a sort of myriological aspect in that proofs or constructions can be combined in various ways to yield potentially new proofs. Um, so a frame shall consist of a space of proofs and a binary operation for combining these. A model is given by assigning variables to sets of proofs over some space, intuitively the set of proofs of that proposition. And the rest of the language is supposed to be interpreted in, according to the BHK conditions, or maybe those variations, uh, suitably formalized. So what sort of structural features should proof spaces or proof combination have? OK, well, one reasonable thing is we should have closure under finite proof combination, uh, but not necessarily infinite. Um, I think this is actually an important philosophical difference between my, um, my semantics here and uh, sort of fine style semantics where he has uh, arbitrary fusions. Um, I don't think we should necessarily allow um, or require that uh, infinite, infinite combinations of proofs be a proof. Um, it sort of is antagonistic to the finitistic uh, philosophy undergirding this, arguably. I, I, can, I can go into that a bit more later, um, but it's, it's also discussed in the paper. Um, proof combination should be idempotent, associative, and commutative. Um, I mean, I think idempotence and associativity are pretty um, benign. Uh, commutativity, depending on how you're thinking of combination, maybe that's a little more troubling. Uh, but again, this is sort of something I discuss more in the paper. Uh, and there should be a null proof or an empty proof. I mean, intuitively, this can be thought of as the proof that verifies the axioms of your theory. Um, I think that's pretty intuitive. Um, so therefore, any proof space is basically a joint semi-lattice with the least element, um, or can be modeled as such. All right, so what restrictions, if any, should proof assignments obey? Well, we could regard a proof of a theorem as being at the same time also a proof of any of its lemmata. Um, this would deliver a sort of inexact semantics in which a heredity condition is imposed on proof assignments. Alternatively, we could advance an exact semantics and impose no heredity condition. But roughly, what is at issue is how relevant we want a proof of a result to be to that result. Um, so the example I use in the paper is the sort of standard proof of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, this says that every integer 
uh, greater than or equal to two has a unique product of primes uh, factorization. There's sort of two lemmas for this. Um, there's the proof of the existence of such a factorization, and there's the proof of the uniqueness of such a factorization. Um, so if you regard the, the proof of the, the, the general result as also being a proof of the existence and uniqueness claims, that's sort of inexact in semantics. Um, but I mean, you might think, well, there's a lot that's in a proof of the theorem that's not relevant to the existence claim per se. I mean, all the stuff about uniqueness is not really relevant to that. Um, so if you wanted to say a proof of that theorem is not a proof of the existence claim per se, um, it's not, you want a more relevant notion, um, then that's sort of go to, to go the exact route. Um, so I hope that's fairly intuitively clear. But again, if it's if it's not clear, the, the paper will make it more clear. Um, it turns out that taking the exact route, you end up with logics in the neighborhood of Urquhart's semi-lattice relevance logic S. And taking the inexact route, you end up with standard intermediate logics like intuitionistic logic and Yonkov's logic. So I will now give a formal exposition of the semi-lattice semantics for J, that is intuitionistic logic and show how it uh, embodies certain aspects of the foregoing informal presentation. So here's more formally what a semi-lattice frame is. It's just a joint semi-lattice with the least element zero. Um, so this operation is going to satisfy the properties of uh, impotence, associativity, and commutativity. Uh, the frames of the semantics are identical to those used by Urquhart to model the implicational fragments of R and J. Here's a model. Intuition is like semi lattice models structure MFV, where F is a semi lattice frame, and V is note this a, uh, a function from propositional variables and bottom to sets of states, uh, subject to the following conditions. So we have a heredity condition on propositional variables, we have a heredity condition on bottom, and if X satisfies bottom, it has to satisfy all the propositional variables. So this is just reiterating that. Uh, note that an intuition of semi-lattice models are required to satisfy a heredity condition, both through propositional variables and bottom. Also, bottom must satis satisfy what Fine calls the strict falsing condition. Something similar is done by Veldman in this paper. Um, not quite the same, but similar. Uh, it should be clear enough how a semi-lattice frame is to be interpreted on the informal picture previously developed. S is to be regarded as a set of proofs or constructions. Uh, this square cup is regarded as an operation of proof combination, and zero is the sort of null proof. Uh, a heredity condition is imposed on the models, as I pointed out, so the semantics is going to be inexact in that sense. Uh, and of course, the heredity condition will generalize. All right, here are our truth conditions. Um, given a semi-lattice model, ms0 cup v, the relation mx is defined as follows. So this is obvious. Um, this is maybe not so obvious, but I'll talk about it. Um, here's the sort of extensional conjunction condition, extensional disjunction, and here's the important arrow condition, um, which just comes directly out of Urquhart. Um, all right, and here's the heredity fact. So I, I'm about to discuss um, how these conditions relate to the PHK conditions previously given, but uh, I'll just give you a moment to sort of absorb them before moving on. Oops. Okay. The uh, truth conditions for the formula, which are for the most part just those of Urquhart, uh, connect in obvious ways to the foregoing BHK conditions and their variants. In particular, the formal conditions C, D, and E. C, D, and E correspond to the informal conditions one prime, two, and three. Um, the formal condition for bottom namely B corresponds to the informal condition for prime. Uh, and that's brought out by the following result. So for prime is the one that says that a proof of bottom is a proof of everything, right? So this result makes it clear that the previous result, uh, together with the conditions I've imposed on models delivers that informal condition. Obviously it doesn't correspond to the usual BHK condition, uh, which says that bottom has no proof because I haven't required that the bottom be empty. 
Regarding conjunction, it would have been possible to give semantics for J using a formal condition more akin to the conventional BHK condition. That's the condition that's specified in terms of combination in place of this sort of extensional condition one prime. The truth condition would have amounted to the truth condition Urquhart gives for fusion or intentional conjunction, if you're familiar with relevance logic, which is similar to this condition that Van Frossen uh, articulates in his journal of philosophy paper. Um, here it is. Um, this would correspond directly to the sort of combination condition. A proof of a conjunction just is a combination of things that prove both of the conjuncts. Uh, these are obviously equivalent over the class of models um, that I'm interested in. Um, I mean, you can prove that to yourself or you can just see my paper. So on the other hand, uh, it's not possible to treat bottom in a manner consistent with the conventional BHK condition four, that is by stipulating that it is never the case that X satisfies bottom uh, because that's going to overgenerate. And basically the reason why it overgenerates is because every joint semi-lattice is a directed partial order. And as you probably most of you know, um, intuitionistic logic is not complete with respect to that class of partial orders. So phi is gonna be valid in an intuitionistic semi-lattice model, MS0 cup phi, um, if the zero element makes phi true. So that is if it's sort of made true by the axioms, so to speak. Um, CJ is the class of intuition of some of this model. So phi is going to be valid in that class or simply valid um, if every model makes it, satisfies it. Um, so axiomatize J in any adequate way with bottom as a primitive uh, and let turnstile J phi mean that phi is a theorem of J. Uh, by the argument given in my paper, um, we have soundness completeness. Okay, easy enough. All right, uh, let's talk about variations. People familiar with Fine's truth maker semantics for intuitionistic logic um, will have observed that there's much in common between the two approaches, uh, but the differences are not to be understated. Uh, Fine models J using the following type of frame, which he calls exact frames. An exact frame, a state space is a structure, uh, S partial order, um, which is complete and residuated. Um, that is for any arbitrary set there's going to be at least upper bound. Um, so I, I said earlier why I don't like that condition uh, and why we shouldn't have that condition, um, but this condition is imposed. And residuation, um, which looks like this. Um, I, I mean, I won't get too much into the details of this. Um, the, the formal details are a little bit complicated, but anyway, the, the, there's the condition. The central difference between the frames, the two approaches is that while it's obvious every exact frame is a semi-lattice frame, the converse is not true. However, many semi-lattice frames are exact frames. For example, any finite distributive semi-lattice frame is going to be one. Uh, hence, in this precise technical sense, the semi-lattice semantics is the more general framework. Um, onto the models, the central difference is that fine imposes no general heredity condition on those models as is required in the semi-lattice semantics. A caveat though, to characterize J, fine nevertheless has to appeal to a certain sort of inexact relation. Final difference I'll point out is that uh, the two accounts treat the conditional differently. Uh, fine gives its truth condition as follows. Um, I'm not going to try to say this out, but um, it's this thing. Um, the, the apparent gulf between this condition and Urquhart's condition notwithstanding, um, over certain structures, they are in fact inexactly equivalent. Um, what I mean by that is that, um, well, it, it, it's specified in terms of this inexact relation that fine defines. Um, so in terms of that, they are inexactly equivalent. So, I, I mean, there's an interesting philosophical question about whether the sort of fine condition for the conditional gets at the BHK condition more naturally. Uh, than Urquhart's condition. Um, I don't, I think as I say in the paper, I mean, they, they can both lay claim to uh, articulating aspects of the condition. And partly this is just because the condition gets articulated in different ways in the literature. Um, so I, I don't know if one needs to take a position on which is sort of more natural, but um, in any case, the Urquhart condition is um, less complicated, I suppose. 
Um, without toying with the frames, semi lattice semantics for KC, Yankov's logic can be obtained from the semi lattice semantics for J simply by modifying the truth condition at the bottom. Recall that KC can be ax uh, obtained axiomatically from J by adding the following schema, that is the schema of the weak law of excluded middle. Um, the truth condition for bottom is then just the usual BHK condition. Um, so in this sense, at least, at least in the present semantic framework, Yankov's logic, KC, more nearly embodies the usual BHK semantics for J. I mean, I think there's something interesting philosophical uh, going on here. Um, if you do think the semantics does a good job capturing what the core of the BHK semantics is, maybe you would think that um, Yankov's logic is somehow more, somehow fits the intuitive semantics better. Um, but uh, again, that's not, that's not a thesis that I'm necessarily committed to. Um, Alternatively, KC can be presented in a language which takes uh, squiggle negation as primitive in place of bottom. Uh, then the truth condition is going to be the sort of one you would expect. Uh, X satisfies squiggle phi if and only if for all y, uh, X couple y does not satisfy phi. Uh, formulating KC in this way makes its relation to the quasi-relevant logic S negation studied in Weiss uh, 21 obvious. Um, so this, this system can be regarded as an exactification or a, um, a quasi-relevant companion of KC, but I'm about to discuss a different quasi-relevant companion. So without tweaking either of the frames or the truth conditions, a further way of modifying the semi-lattice semantics for to yield new logics is simply to at least partly drop the heredity conditions. Removing the heredity requirements and propositional variables, though not bottom, from models for J yields what I'm calling SJ. Um, and removing the same requirement for models for KC, formulating with bot as a primitive rather than squiggle negation, yields the quasi-relevant companion, uh, the quasi-relevant system SKC, the uh, unofficial logic of the Saul Kripke Center. Um, these systems are so named to highlight that their positive fragments uh, just coincide with Urquhart's and Lowe's logic S. So, I mean, the conservative extension result is obvious. Uh, so SJ and SKC may naturally be regarded as relevant or exact companions of J and KC. Uh, and I, I should note that these logics are not relevant in the strict sense because they both make this, for example, valid, uh, which contravenes the variable sharing property as it's normally formulated. Uh, I don't really think this is a really deep point, um, particularly in view of these logics being conservative extensions of S. And anyway, I should note that R and E are sometimes themselves formulated with top and bottom. And I don't think anybody would say that that makes them irrelevant. Um, so, but I mean, if you are a stickler, we can call them quasi relevance logics rather than relevance logics. Uh, I think SJ and SKC are interesting logics and logics that ought to have a good amount of intuitive appeal to constructivists with a relevantistic bent or relevantists with a constructivist bent. Uh, I've given sound and complete labeled sequence calculi for them in my paper, section six. Um, these results notwithstanding, much remains unknown about these systems. So I haven't axiomatized them. Um, the axiomatizations will presumably be, be quite complicated, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a worthy project for anybody who wants to pursue it. All right, so I mean, this is this is basically the end. So uh, I've shown not only that J can be characterized exactly with the center lattice semantics, and that the semantics has a natural BHK inspired interpretation, but also that simple variations on the semantics yield other interesting logic besides. Uh, so in sum, let me note that there are many fairly elementary facts about S and its neighbors, including those that I just presented um, that remain unknown. So for example, it's unknown whether S is decidable. Um, this problem is left open in Urquhart's seminal paper on decidability, well, undecidability results for R and E and related systems. And it was reiterated as unsolved as recently as 2016. And so far as I'm aware, it's still unsolved. Um, since I take it that the philosophical interest of this and related systems should now be beyond doubt, I would encourage you to take up the study of semi-lattice semantics and myriad applications. So uh, consider yourself exhorted. All right, that's it. Okay, well. However you want to do it, let's thank the speaker. <clears throat> and
And so uh, I've, I'm looking at the chat window. Do we have questions? Uh, so far, no, which seems surprising. Hmm. Well, perhaps the problem is nobody touch types. Uh, I, well, I have just one question in passing. Is there any a possibility, I mean, you, you uh, objected to infinitary operations here. Is there any possibility of uh, uh, extending what you're doing to include quantification? I think so. Um, Fine discusses quantification briefly in his paper, and I assume that, that a similar method would work for mine. Uh, I haven't actually looked into it, um, but uh, yeah, I, I suspect so. Okay. Uh, let's see. Some... May I ask one question? Yes, uh, of course. Here? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, as I understand, the, the, the structure of the proof set is, uh, is quite abstract, isn't it? I mean, you, you haven't taken any particular uh, definition of proof. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, the, the frames are just algebraic structures, um, but they're algebraic structures which intuitively sort of. No, 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 not frames. I am talking about proofs. So you 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 have taken the proofs set of proofs as a uh, semi-lattice structure, isn't it? It turns out to be a semi-lattice structure. Uh, but you have not given any uh, any particular definition of proof. Is it so? Yeah, they're they're just primitives of the semantics. Hmm? Sorry, it, they're just treated as primitives in the semantics. It, it's an undefined term. It is an undefined term. Right, right, right. So, so, uh, so. What will be the uh, uh, what will be a, a, a specific example of uh, a proof of a conjunction of a formula? When, as you say, uh, from the constructive angle, proof of conjunction is proof of both proofs of both. So there are two proofs. Do you mean that? Well, there, there's two conditions for conjunction, right? So there's the extensional conjunction, con condition, which is just a proof of one. That's also a proof of the other. And then and that there's- That is the second one. That's the second definition. But and then there's the- first and there's, definition. The intentional condition is that it's in some sense, a combination of both. That, that could be different than just, uh, that could be different than either one separately. Just sort of a merological sum. Yeah. Well, right. Uh, maybe uh, it's not clear to me, but I, I definitely can contact you later for, for okay. more detail. Yeah. Thank you. I've had two people raise their hands here, and I did not see which one came first. So I'm just going to take them in the order I see them on the screen here. Uh, no, there's, there's also somebody in the chat. Oh, in the chat also. Uh, well, I don't see a question in the chat. I see a, a, a mention of a paper that you might find relevant. Okay, so David, do you want to ask your question and uh, then Andreas? Uh, yes, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, have you had any success in uh, massaging this approach to uh, obtain a, a classical negation? Uh, 
Um, well, it's it's not really something I've uh, I've thought of. I mean, the I guess the obvious thing to do would just be to use the classical negation condition. Um, although I, I don't know what that will will give you. Um, you. You know, I mean, there are these sort of classical relevant logics um, where you use the sort of expected condition, and then you don't get uh, a collapse of the relevant logic into classical logic. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure what happens in the present context. Um, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, Andreas? Well, thank you very much for your talk. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I was intrigued by the um, difference between the um, intuitionistic um, treatment of, of bottom and your alternative. Um, I, I should say I had some technical difficulties um, and I didn't hear everything. So maybe you did say something about it, but um, if you didn't, could you say a bit more about the philosophical interpretation of this um, difference of allowing um, that there is a proof of bottom, but that it is a proof of everything. So what, what's nice about it is that um, it makes much clearer why explosion holds an in indigenistic logic, um, something that you know people like Kolmogorov were actually on the fence about, and, and then people um, intrigued by minimal logic were actually rejecting. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's a bit unclear what it is. Is it an impossible proof? Is it a faulty proof? Is there, um, yeah, so it's just something that um, um, intrigues me. What, what should we think about this kind of proof? Right. So, um, in, in order to get intuitionistic logic in my semantics, um, you have to use the sort of non standard BHK condition, um, which, as you were pointing out, um, is basically a proof of bottom is a proof of everything. Um, now, I mean, formally, uh, it, it holds in semantics essentially by uh, stipulation. You impose conditions on proofs of bottom such that this works out in such a way. Um, what is to be said about it philosophically? Uh, well, I think there's various things you could say. Um, yeah, in, in the in the framework, you could allow for. Um, so, I mean, intuitively, you could allow for proof spaces that have um, proofs of contradictions in them. Um, they're they're not really para consistent because any any proof that is a proof of bottom will be a proof of every everything. Um, but at the same time, it's not the case that any proof in the space will be a proof of bottom. So not any proof in the space will be a proof of everything. Um, I, I mean, it's, again, it's, it's something that I haven't really thought about in any great, any super great detail. Um, but I think there's, um, potentially some things that can be said about it. Um, what, one other thing, since you brought up minimal negation, um, actually, actually in, uh, the sort of original Urquhart paper in 1972, um, he talks at length about uh, adding a minimal negation to the semi-lattice semantics. And I, I think that's where he inclines anyway. Um, you can do that also. Um, so, I mean, the, thing, the systems that I was talking about have stronger negations. Um, but if you were, for whatever reason, uh, more inclined to a, a more thoroughly paraconsistent route, um, that would also be possible. Okay, uh, then uh, Valentin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Yale, for the nice talk. I have one question, not on the talk itself, but on the uh, now quite famous uh, open problem that you mentioned at the end about the decidability less. And I know that you have done some uh, work on you know, trying to make a progress in that direction. And you have made progress. So I, I want to hear basically uh, your opinion of uh, first, what makes the problem so difficult? And second, what is your hunch? And where, wh what would you bet on? Uh, just give us your, uh, your wisdom and your perspective on, on the current status of that problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a coin to flip. Um, <laughs> so uh, let, let, me, let me do the, the second one first. Um, my hunch is that it is decidable. Um, and basically, I mean, I don't know if this is a good reason, but um, if you're familiar with like the natural deduction systems for it that have been developed by Charlwood and so on, they admit of normalization 
and other nice proof theoretic properties. Um, so I suspect some proof theoretic technique will show that it's decidable. Um, why is it so difficult? Um, that's, I, I don't have a good answer. Um, I mean, it was so difficult just to axiomatize the thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have any very compelling thing. Do you, do you have any ideas about why it's so difficult? No, actually, I was hoping to hear your wisdom. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so about a year ago or so, we, we, had a, we had a chat, we had a sort of a, a quick attempt uh, together with, with Sarah to, to attack it with proof theoretic uh, uh, methods. We haven't given up on that yet, but we kind of, we realized that the problem is much more difficult than what meets the eye. And of course, that was to be expected because it has been open for a long time, but we kind of realized that uh, in, in our own experience. Uh, but uh, I mean, in, in fairness, we didn't really try very hard and very long. So uh, you, you have done much more uh, on that. And I, I hope that you will give us the secret as to what. Uh, but OK, so you are betting on decidability. And that was our bet too, which means that we can at least join forces in, in, uh, in hoping, <laughs> if not trying. OK. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? Well, the, 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 then let me ask a speculative question. Um, just out of, out of curiosity, if instead of uh, uh, conditions on negation, uh, leave negation out of it. Is there some natural formulation of what would amount to Peirce's law? Uh, well, you could just restrict yourself to the one element semi-lattice. Yeah. And uh, I guess process all will be valid there, right? Um, yeah. I, the, the question is simply, can it, can it be done in a natural way given the machinery you've got? Well, maybe, but uh, I don't know. I mean, it seems sort of <laughs> anathema to the spirit of the project. Um, it's a fair answer. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, then well, let's thank the speaker and. Uh... Thank you. Thank yeah. you to thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Ramila, Yale, Mel, for uh, animating this session. And uh, we will have uh, the next session of the Logic Universities webinar uh, next week with uh, Tim Perkoff, who will speak about logical constants and the presentation of the Croatian Association of Logic. And thank you also, Hunch, for uh, 